Hello, everyone, and welcome to Guardianship in Kentucky, provided by EFMP Family Support and Kentucky SPIN. At uh, this time, I am going to introduce Marla Harris. Uh, she has a few things to say, and then I will be right back. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. <laughs> um, my name is Marla Harris. I'm the Exceptional Family Member Program Family Support Coordinator at uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Um, we provide uh, information, resources, and support to our military families that have uh, a family member with some type of disability. Um, I hope that some of our folks on here today are our military folks. Um, if you are, give me a shout out on the chat um, so I can know who you are. Um, otherwise, I am looking forward to this great information so that I can share with all my families. Thank you so much for partnering with, with us. Thank you, Marla. Next, thank you, Kelly. Um, so just a little bit about Kentucky SPIN, uh, Kentucky Special Parent Involvement Network. We are funded by the U.S. Department of Education under IDEA since 1988 when Kentucky first received a PTI. Kentucky SPIN Parent Center provides training, information, and support for children and youth with all types of disabilities, birth through age 26 and beyond, their parents, families, and professionals. Uh, I also want to add that it's very important to know that you do not have to have a diagnosis to reach out. We do not require that. So at Kentucky Spin, it's easier for me to tell you um, what we don't do in comparison to what we do. Uh, we do not act as attorneys and we are not advocates. However, uh, we do empower families to effectively advocate for their children and themselves. We provide a peer-to-peer -peer support to help families access the needed information and resources. Um, and during today's session, it is being recorded. If you feel that you need to get up and take care of yourself um, or handle something, this will be available uh, to rewatch later. We don't want you to go without meeting your needs um, in fear of missing something. Also, uh, I will ask for grace for our team as we all work from home. Um, and for a lot of us, it's spring break. We may have children roaming around, dogs, uh, internet issues. Please bear with us as we uh, move forward through this. And chat and Q&A are open. If there's something that you need clarification on or you have a question, please feel free to put that in the chat and we will answer that as soon as possible. Uh, and at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly Smith and she will be walking us through guardianship. Lord, trying to unmute. You would think that we would have it together at this point, but I still struggle. Um, I have placed in the chat box um, that real-time captions are available here in this Zoom session. Um, or you can click on the link and you can follow the real-time captions there as well. Uh, we are going to repost that a few times throughout this training uh, for anyone who may come in a little bit late. Um, I also want to let everybody know that Nick is going to be placing a link to this presentation in the chat box for everyone to download and access uh, as we go through uh, this session today. So jumping right in, we're going to talk about uh, today's agenda. So feel free to ask questions during this presentation, but I'm going to do my best to leave some time at the end uh, in case anybody has any they want to wait, you know, want to save until then. Um, so we're first going to talk about an overview of guardianship in Kentucky and the age of majority. Uh, we're going to talk about the different types of guardianship, alternatives to guardianship, how to apply for guardianship, 
and questions and answers. I'm not sure why all those are numbered one, but we're going to roll with it. So, uh, does anybody uh, know what the age of majority is in Kentucky? Okay, so if you don't know, the age of majority in Kentucky is age 18. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means here in just a second. Um, and so how about in the chat if you guys answer the following question. Um, parents of children with disabilities are automatically guardians of their child when they reach the age of majority. Absolutely correct. No, you are not automatically the guardian of a child with a disability. So once the parent or once the child reaches the age of majority in Kentucky, the parent is no longer their legal guardian and cannot make decisions on their behalf with or without, or I'm sorry, without their child's consent. Um, and that kind of is different in schools. Uh, well, it's not really different, but it applies to schools as well. So, like, mo lots of people think that because um, because they have always represented uh, their child in IEP meetings, and ARC meetings, and things of that nature, and, and the parents have made all the decisions, that no longer is applicable uh, once your child turns 18, even in school. So, this applies to every... Uh, everyone, regardless of the quote unquote severity of the disability. Um, and you will need to go other routes to continue to contribute in the IEP process and in other decision making choices, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment. Um, so, of course, in Kentucky, the age of uh, majority is 18, uh, with the exception of alcoholic beverages. Um, so you got to be 21 in order to buy alcoholic beverages, but for all other purposes, you're considered an adult. So um, the age majority is something that sometimes needs more clarification um, and regarding, regarding that age of majority and parents being considered the natural guardians. Um, so parents do not have to, attend, to have to obtain guardianship in order to continue to attend ARC or IEP meetings. Um, your child can invite you to attend, and then there's another route that can be taken, and that is um, filling out a form or writing a statement. Uh, the form is called the Determination of an of Educational Representative Form. It is not really for this purpose, but it can be used for, uh, for your disabled child and you attending those meetings. So let me move on here to the next slide. Okay, so this is, this is that form that I was just talking about. So this is available on the KDE website and the links in this presentation are all clickable. Um, so, and then we have resources at the end that we'll go over uh, before uh, before we finish. Um, but this is something that can be filled out uh, by your student. Um, and I also would recommend, even if you fill this out, um, maybe submitting a letter and uh, to the school. And we're going to go over on the next slide uh, what that letter would need to state. So very simply, it could say something like, dear school personnel, I give consent and permission for, it would be the parent's name or whoever the child um, prefers to act as my educational representative and attend all ARC and IEP meetings or any other necessary meetings to help me with my educational decisions. And then your student would sign um, and date that. Uh, it's also a good idea to have this form notarized and then given to a school and make sure that you keep a copy uh, for your own file. But it can be something just as simple as that um, to allow you 
to be their educational representative um, and, and to help them through that process. So some things you are going to want to consider. And I want, uh, let me kind of add a little bit of a disclaimer here. So we are going to talk about the, you know, the process of applying for guardianship and kind of what, you know, what goes, what happens when you're applying for guardianship. Um, but we will absolutely advocate for uh, supported decision making. And we're going to talk more about what that means. Um, when it comes to individuals with disabilities and um, filing for guardianship. Uh, myself, um, I am the mother of a 26-year-old uh, young man who has a traumatic brain injury. He has actually sustained three brain injuries over the course of his life. Uh, I am not his guardian, um, but when I tell you that every day I wrestle with the decision of whether or not to file for guardianship, uh, I'm being very honest. Um, uh, I wrestle with it every single day. Um, when he was in high school and we were told, you know, this was very briefly explained to us in an IEP meeting. Um, and they recommended that I apply for guardianship at that point. Um, I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. You know, he's been through enough. He, he, if things are hard enough for him, I'm not taking his rights away. Um, and they were concerned at that, at that point in time that he would be easily taken advantage of. Well, I can tell you that their concerns uh, were right. They were they were absolutely valid in their concerns. Um, I could not get outside of uh, my mom brain uh, long enough to long enough to really consider what was best for him. And so, at seventeen you know, 17 years old, I didn't really, there were obvious differences between him and his peers, but they weren't so significant that um, it seemed to make much of a difference. You know, they played ball in their spare time and, and they ran around and uh, he didn't drive, a, he, he had a car, but he, he drove a car, he had his license, he was the first of his friends to have his license in a car. Um, now he made very poor decisions behind the wheel, um, but I, I didn't really see, I didn't really see a whole lot of difference in him and his peers. And I didn't have a lot of resources, you know, that was, you know, almost 10 years ago now. I didn't have a lot of resources at my fingertips. I wasn't yet working for Kentucky Spin, was not familiar with Kentucky Spin. Um, I didn't, I didn't know, uh, what to look for, what to consider. I was just like, no, I'm not doing that to him. And, um, so today I'm going to present you with all the things I wish I had at that time. Um, because as he gets older, you know, when I look at him now at, at almost 27, there is a huge difference, a huge, gigantic gap between him now and his peers. Um, so I, I encourage all of you as, as you get this information and especially if you're a parent, um, to step back, get outside of your parent brain um, and do and have the courage, have the courage I didn't have and that I still don't have to do what is right and what is needed for your child. Um, this is not anything to take lightly or with a grain of salt uh, because this is their life, right? Um, and just, it, it's also important that you know that if you do file for guardianship, that doesn't mean that you're automatically going to get it. 
Uh, so I just kind of wanted to throw that in there so you guys would know and understand where I'm coming from. Um, let me look. I know we have something. There um, is a question, Kelly, concerning the form um, over uh, school. You will. Okay. So, um, Bonnie says we won't need this if we have guardianship. That is correct. You will not need that form if you are guardian. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, first, you want to uh, consider uh, what are the abilities of your child? Can they take care of their own personal needs? Uh, when my when my son was in his last year or going into his last year of high school and we had an uh, IEP meeting and he was on the traditional diploma track um, and we were talking about, you know, what does he need? What kind of goals does he need for this year? Um, when we started talking about independent living goals, it was simply explained to me, well, can he, you know, can he shower on his own? Can he fix himself something to eat? And I'm like, yeah, he can. So we didn't have any of those independent living goals. Well, he can shower if you tell him, Cody, you need to shower. It's time. It, you got to take a shower today. Um, or he can fix himself something to eat if it doesn't involve following a recipe. Um, using a stove can be very dangerous because he forgets to turn it off. Um, he also uh, doesn't wipe like um, grease splatter off the stove, so you know a fire is is a risk. Um, I never got into that deep dive, you know, that deep dive of you know his personal needs and what you know what his abilities are. Uh, can they manage their finances? Um, so can they? Are they capable not only of knowing what bills are, what bills need to be paid, that do they understand the difference between wants and needs? Do they know that their needs come first? Uh, then do they have the ability to actually do the task of paying the bills? Um, can they be easily taken advantage of? And then are there any other alternatives available? And so we're gonna talk about some of those alternatives as we go through. So again, these are just really good to consider when you're trying to determine what level of support your child is going to need when they each when they reach that age of majority. So what kind of skills should they know uh, before reaching the age of majority? So communication communication skills. Are they able to communicate what they want and what they don't want without also relying on someone else to make those decisions for them? Uh, do they have a self-understanding of their disability? Do they know the name of their disability and what effect it has on them as an adult? Do they have self-advocacy -advoc skills? Uh, so can they effectively use their voice to express their wants and needs? Uh, can they let others know if something is not going right for them or uh, if something has made them feel uncomfortable? Or do they know uh, if something's not going right for them? Um, I know with my own child and I guess for me too, I can remember being, you know, in my early 20s, my mom would <laughs> say something to me and I thought she was, I mean, I thought she was, an idiot. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, our kids with disabilities, you know, they're, they're human, you know, they're kids. Uh, they have human, they have regular feelings, they have regular reactions to a lot of things. So again, you want to think about what is their ability uh, and then maybe what is, you know, just being, just being a kid. Um, do they have the ability to set goals? Uh, do they know what they want to do with uh, their future, you know, once they get out of high school? Can they understand the steps in the process to reach that goal and what, you know, what they're going to have to do to reach that goal? Um, if not, 
what skills are needed in order to successfully accomplish a future goal. So how can you turn that into, uh, into a goal for them? Uh, can they problem solve? What will they do if they are in a situation that requires them to make some really hard decisions or find ways to get out of certain situations if they need to? Uh, what are the steps that they need to go through to solve problems quickly and effectively? And how can those skills be strengthened? Social skills and friendship skills. So social and friendship skills look, that looks very different as an adult uh, than it does as a, a, a student or a, a child. Because if I walk up to you at 44 years old and say, hey, do you want to be my friend? You're probably going to think I'm weird and tell me to go away. So it's very different. So we need to consider how they make friends. What kind of social skills do they have? Do they have friends at all? Uh, do they initiate conversation uh, that are not only about what they're interested in? Are they able to uh, participate in the give and take of those relationships? Do they have a knowledge of their rights and what their legal rights are? Um, do they vote? Uh, are they involved in activities outside of what their family does? Do they have their own life? Uh, that they're living? Uh, are they able to tell people about their disability? So you want to make sure that they are aware of, again, the name of their disability, how it affects them, and how to ask for assistance when they need it. So um, M. Ward has a quote that says, barriers such as overprotection are usually more disabling than the limitations imposed by a person's physical or mental disability. Uh, as parents, we must begin to let our children fly and begin to experience life like their typical peers. Uh, always remember uh, that, first of all, what is cute at you know six is not going to be cute at twenty, but you do want them to be able to have freedom to explore their interests and uh, explore a life of their own. And that's really, really hard to do because we just want to protect them. You know, uh, we know that being an adult can be so, so hard and so traumatizing all on its own without uh, a disability. So we're, you know, we, I fully believe we always have the best intentions at heart, but lots of times, just like he says, um, we can be more disabling uh, than the limitations imposed by that physical or mental disability. Uh, Leonard Sweet said, the future is not something we enter. The future is something we create. And creating that future requires us to make choices and decisions. And that all begins with a dream. So I know that uh, many of us um, are probably not in the first job we ever had. Uh, many of us are probably not in the first uh, relationship we've ever had. A lot of us probably do not have friends that we used to have and probably for good reason. Um, we have to remember that our kiddos, even without you know, with or without disabilities, they still have the right to those experiences. Those experiences are what make us who we are. Uh, that's how we learn, right? So we still want our kids with disabilities to have those, uh, we want them to have those choices and we want them to have those experiences that are gonna shape them into uh, that well-rounded adult. So while in school, we fought for an inclusive education for our children with disabilities or the least restrictive environment. But for some reason, when they turn 18, we immediately feel like we have to go to the most restrictive. Uh, and lots of times, parents jump straight into that um, and, and turn to full guardianship. Now, let me add, there are times and there are disabilities that require that. Absolutely, 100%. But then there are other disabilities that don't. Um, or um, 
that that young person's abilities um, may allow you to look into other alternatives. Um, so the most restrictive environment is guardianship. So when you're when you're thinking of guardianship, think of it just like the you know least restrictive environment or LRE in school. Guardianship is the most restrictive. So, and that may not always be the best solution, and it may. This, of course, has to be an individualized decision. And look at all the options before you make those life-changing decisions. So, uh, some terms and some options uh, are on this slide. The first one is uh, guardianship. It is a legal tool that grants a parent or another adult uh, the legal authority to make decisions for a legally disabled adult. A guardian has complete responsibility for the person, including all their financial affairs. Then there's a limited guardian. A limited guardian does not have all the legal powers and duties, but they are assigned uh, powers and duties by a judge. Uh, a conservator, that person has the responsibility for uh, the person's financial affairs. And then there's a limited conservator that has some responsibilities for financial, a person's financial affairs. Um, so alternatives to guardianship. Okay, so you are going to want to uh, definitely, whether you're looking into um, guardianship or not, or you are a guardian, um, you want to provide additional skills training and development for these uh, adults, right? You want them um, to be able to handle things on their own or with support if needed. Uh, you can be a co-signer to help with money management. Um, or you may be, um, you know, out on a bank account, you can be a co-signer, or you may have a joint account. Um, you can also open a Kentucky stable account. I'm not going to go into stable accounts, but this link, again, is clickable, and you can feel free to dig into that as much as you would like. Uh, you can create a power of attorney document. This gives one person the ability to make certain decisions on behalf of another. And then representative payee. Uh, so this allows someone else to manage SSI and Social Security payments for the person. So again, representative payee only applies to uh, either an SSI recipient or a Social Security disability beneficiary. Uh, some other alternatives to guardianship are signing advanced directives that allows adults who can communicate health care decisions to provide directions about what they want if they're not able to do that. Uh, and then supported decision making. And we're going to focus a lot on supported de decision making as we go um, in, you know, a little bit further into this training. So what is supported decision making? Uh, supported decision making is one of the choices of the alternative of alternatives to guardianship. Um, again, there are others which I previously mentioned, but for just a, a few minutes, we're going to focus on this one. So when I say rights equals choice and choice equals self-determination. Supported decision making is a recognized alternative to guardianship uh, through which people with disabilities use friends, family members, and professionals to help them understand the situation and choices that they face. They can also make their own decisions. Um, so they can make their own decisions with the need for a guardian. So supported decision making really is um, something used for individuals who may need a guardian but listen well to others. Um, SupportiveDecisionMaking.org is an amazing website. Uh, we should have some trainings on our, um, on our website uh, or on our YouTube channel on supported decision making. 
Um, but there are some great, great trainings on supported decision making available. Um, and it is very important that our young people realize that we all use supported decision making with or without a disability. Uh, taxes. So if you have an accountant prepare your taxes, that's supported decision making. If you see a doctor when you're sick um, or seeking other medical care, that's supported decision making. If you ask me something about a car, I don't know anything. So I have to talk to someone who does. Same thing goes with a house. Those are all aspects of supported decision making. And it's very important that our kiddos understand that we all use supported decision making. And it is not a negative thing to use that. Look here in the chat. Um, oh, Amber, Amber placed um, a YouTube link in uh, the chat box for everyone. So uh, thank you for that, Amber. So what does the National Guardianship Association say? Uh, guardianship, uh, the National Guardianship Association says that guardianship should be utilized only when the lesser restrictive supports are not available. Alternatives to guardianship, included supporting decision-making, should always be identified and considered whenever possible prior to the commencement of guardianship proceedings. Whenever guardianship is necessary to assist a person, the guardianship must be limited to allow the maximum retention of individual rights and be customized to the individual needs of the person under the guardianship. And of course, here is another uh, clickable link um, where you can find that statement. Uh, let's see. Oh, did you just send a link to the, Amber, did you send a link to the YouTube channel? I did send a link to the YouTube channel. I'm so sorry, my dogs are barking, um, but I am, grabbing the specific video and I'll put that in right now, Samantha. Thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the guardianship process. Um, so the first thing that happens is the petitioner, that's the person filing for guardianship. I also want to add here uh, that anyone can file for guardianship of anyone. Amber may decide that I'm making a colossal mess of my life and that I need a guardian, and she can go file for guardianship of me. Um, and I, there are probably many times <laughs> when that could be done. But just, just, just so you know, anybody can do that. Uh, so the person who files the, the petition, that is the petitioner, and that is done in the district court where the respondent, the respondent is the individual of, uh, in which someone is seeking guardianship of. So for me, I would be the petitioner and my son would be the respondent or Amber would be the petitioner and I would be the respondent. Uh, so the respondent will be represented by an attorney if they cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to them. Um, uh, like I said, um, they can, you know, the individual can choose, you know, if they can afford to pay their own. Um, evaluations will be completed by a doctor, a psychologist, and a social worker. Uh, this does not necessarily say there is nothing in the reg regulations that says that, it, that they have to do an IQ test. Uh, so that was a, a question that came up recently. Um, but IQ, it, it's important, but it's not a determining factor uh, altogether in in this in this decision. Uh, so these person uh, these persons may be referred to as the interdisciplinary team. Uh, they will then submit reports and file those with the court, and then copies would also be sent to the petitioner. Uh, and to the respondent. Then a hearing is held to determine whether the respondent is disabled, partially disabled, or not disabled. Again, it is not up to the petitioner to make that decision. 
that decision is made by a judge. Uh, this hearing can be held before a judge or if any party requests a jury. Uh, it was, well, I think it, we go over in the maybe next slide. Um, this is also referred to as a disability trial. Uh, this was one of the ultimate factors in uh, at, the, at the time when my son turned 18 that I chose not uh, to file for guardianship because at that time it was a little different and there was a jury trial and I did not want to do that to him. Um, so again, this is called a disability trial and the county attorney will either enter evidence and a member of the interdisciplinary team will attend to give testimony about the report uh, that they turned in to uh, the court. If the respondent is determined to be disabled or partially disabled, the judge will then appoint an appropriate guardian, guardian and or conservator if it is determined that the respondent is not disabled, then no one will be appointed anything. So again, just keep in mind, uh, these decisions are made by a judge. Now, the links on this page are KentuckyGuardianship.org, uh, as well as the Kentucky Guardianship Association Guardianship Manual. It is very, very detailed. Um, as to uh, guardianship proceedings and the things that you need to know. Um, let's see. Michelle says, if someone is not receiving SSI first, would this be a hearing also to establish them or also to establish them as being disabled for that benefit then? No. Um, now that may be, um, it may be favorable in their social security decision um, but it, it does not, um, Social Security has to go through their own thing. Um, so it doesn't automatically approve them. Uh, if that does not answer your question, just let me know in the chat. Um, Cause I wanna, I, I definitely want that to be clear. Thank you. And then we have another question. It says, I was told by my daughter's developmental pediatrician that we can utilize our own specialists and they do not have to be court appointed. Um, I have never heard that. I can't say that that is a fact or not a fact, but I definitely can research that and get back to you on it. Um, I have never heard that you can use your own specialist. Uh, I have always been told that uh, the court would appoint someone. Um, so, uh, Jenny, uh, who is uh, one of our support team on here, would you mind writing that question down uh, along with the person that asked that question um, so I can get back to them on this? And just yep. in case anyone else, just in case anybody else would like to know, uh, we will include the answer to this question in the follow-up email that you will reset, receive probably tomorrow or the next, uh, let's see, tomorrow, Thursday, maybe tomorrow or Monday. Uh, we are out Friday for Good Friday, so I just wanna make sure if you don't get it tomorrow, don't, don't fret, it'll, it'll come. And you are very welcome. Okay, we have another question. Thank you uh, for putting that in the chat. Okay, so moving on, um, there were changes to guardianship in Kentucky in 2018. So Kentucky House Bill 5 amends its jury uh, trial. As I said, it was, uh, it was a jury trial when my son turned 18. Um, and uh, it, it amends its jury trial requirement for guardianship cases. Uh, Kentucky uh, was the only state in the, in the nation at that time that still required jury trials. Uh, so now a bench trial is permissible if the respondent is present, counsel for the respondent, and the attorney for the Commonwealth agree to a bench trial, uh, that there is no objection to a bench trial is made by an interested person or entity, 
and the interdisciplinary evaluation report prepared for the proceedings reflect the unanimous, unanimous consensus of the persons preparing it uh, that the respondent is either disabled, partially disabled, uh, and the court has reviewed the report and the court finds no cause to require a jury trial. So again, that was signed by Matt Bevan in 2018. Okay, and someone says, I'd like for that, I'd like that information too. I was told to have a psychological evaluation when applied for the guardianship. Okay, uh, absolutely. Okay, so the duties of a guardian or conservator. Um, it, uh, I want you to know that this is not an easy process and there are many, many, many documents that are going to be completed following the guardianship hearing uh, if the individual is deemed disabled. Um, so it, the duties of either a guardian or conservator, or you may be both, if, if full guardianship is awarded, um, so they are responsible for the care and custody of the person, uh, managing the financial resources of the person, reporting uh, information to the court, making sure that rights and personal re freedoms aren't restricted. Um, so again, you have, even if you have guardianship, that person should still have personal freedom. Um, a 23-year-old, 25-year-old, 38-year-old, 60-year-old should not be treated like a 10-year-old. Right? They should still have personal freedoms. Um, within 60 days of being appointed, the conservator must file a list of the person's property with the court. And then you must report every two, two, every two years to tell the court how much money the person has received and how it's spent. Uh, so voting rights. Um, it used to be that people lost their voting rights automatically uh, when they were appointed a guardian. So people no longer automatically lose the right to vote if a guardian is appointed. Uh, you also may want to remind the judge of their voting rights to make sure that those, uh, because there is a there is a checkbox uh, that says on that on the the decision whether or not uh, voting rights um, are intact. Um, the judge must make that a specific decision to remove those voting rights. Again, that box would be checked on that form. If a person loses the right to vote, they can petition the court to get it back. And then, of course, with as with all voter registration, make sure um, that they watch the deadlines and that they start um, early. So this picture here is Clayton. Uh, many of you may know Clayton. Uh, Clayton is the son of Kentucky Spins former assistant director. Uh, Director Stella Beard, and um, uh, Clayton uh, actually, you know, and, and Stella will tell you, if you go back and watch our webinars, you can hear her say it herself, you know, she was that parent that automatically jumped to guardianship when Clayton turned 18. We used to present this together because we were on, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum and, and our stories worked really well together. Uh, but she automatically, you know, uh, pursued guardianship. She became his full guardian. Uh, Clayton has an IQ of about 53. Um, and after being his guardian for a couple of years, they then petitioned the court um, so that Clayton could become his own guardian. Um, they wanted to relinquish guardianship because they had found that Satan really valued the opinions and he knew that his, his family was watching out for him and would give him good advice, good sound advice uh, to keep him safe and help make him good decisions. 
And so he signed a, a document uh, on supported decision making, which is not legally required, but he did that. And uh, Clayton, Clayton's rights were restored. Um, and this is after Clayton's first time voting in his first presidential election. And he was so excited and so proud of himself. Um, now, he never lost uh, his, uh, his voting rights, but he was just so excited uh, to make sure that, uh, that he got to cast his vote. Let's see, I have a question here that says, uh, are guardianship requests online or do you have to go to the courthouse? You can fill out the form. You can you can type in the form and then take it, print it and take it to the courthouse, but you are gonna have to go to the courthouse. Um, it, in most in most district or in most counties. Um, again, uh, the county offices vary, so they may have the ability to do that, but you would need to get on uh, the district court's website if they have one uh, and do that, but I don't know of any counties that don't require you to take the form in, and it is not free. There is a fee. The last I knew it was about $140 to file that petition. And I also want to say you do not get that money back if they are not deemed uh, disabled. That is just a fee that has to be, you know, filed that has to accompany the um, the petition. So change is hard. Uh, I, I spoke briefly about how we all make bad decisions and we can all learn from them. Uh, so our adults with disabilities are, are no different. We can't always protect our loved ones with disabilities uh, we have to learn uh, to let them fly, to let them, you know, learn to live their best lives and to learn from their mistakes and have their experiences. Uh, Stephen Donaldson says, we are not promised ease. The purpose of life is not ease. It is to choose and to act upon the choice. In that task, we are not measured by outcomes. We are measured only by daring and effect and resolve. So, uh, here we have some resources for you. Uh, we do have a question before I talk about the resources. Um, are driving and entering into marriage forbidden when in a guardianship? If guardianship is uh, because those are signed contracts. Um, in most cases, um, I have seen that uh, the individual does lose their driver's license um, and if they are, if they lose the right to sign contracts or if full guardianship um, is awarded, then they cannot enter into a marriage. Um, so guardianship and alternatives to guardianship. Uh, sorry, my dog's starting to whine. Um, in Kentucky, that is a protection and advocacy document. I wish I would have had that when my son was 18 years old. Uh, there's a guardianship comparison chart that it discuss, discusses the different types of um, guardianship. Uh, it's a phenomenal document. The KDA Guardianship Manual, which I already talked about and is very, very detailed. Uh, then there is a tool for exploring decision-making support. That is a Charting the Life Course tool. If you are not familiar with Charting the Life Course, I highly recommend you getting, uh, getting familiar with Charting the Life Course. Uh, if I had had this decision-making support tool, um, I probably would have filed for guardianship. Um, and I look at this tool often, even today, um, because it goes through all the things that I didn't think about. Uh, and um, it is helpful for uh, you, you as a parent uh, to fill this out, or if you're a professional and you're attending for you to give your the, the families that you serve to give it to the parents and then also give it to the give it to the young person. Let them say, 
yeah, I think I've got this, or no, I don't, or maybe I need some help with this. That, that may also give you some insight about where your child um, believes that they are functioning. Um, let's see, how soon, soon should we apply for guardianship prior to the child's 18th birthday? Okay, so that also varies by, by county uh, and district court. Um, it never hurts to call the district court and ask them how far in advance um, some say, you know, three months, some say a couple of weeks, some won't even let you file until they're 18. So that really is uh, up to that district court. So I always recommend calling and finding out for sure. Uh, because it, when they make us wait until they're already 18, you know, there's a gap where the, that child is their own guardian. And um, usually how far out in advance they let you do it is, is based on like their caseload and, and how long it's going to take you to get in. Uh, so, um, I wish I had a definite answer for that. Uh, unfortunately I do not. Um, but just call your district court and they can absolutely tell you, uh, how far in advance you should file the paperwork. Okay, and then we have uh, Kentucky Spin Self-Advocacy Tips Infographic uh, and Video. And then Kentucky Spin Self-Determination Infographic and Video. Um, so, sorry, I've got one dog that's mad now. Um, he's got a, he needs everybody to hear him run his mouth. Um, so, Nick is actually on here with us. And Nick is our youth uh, educator. Uh, Nick is, uh, Nick, would you mind, since we have a few minutes, would you mind uh, just unmuting, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, <laughs> and uh, tell it everybody kind of a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah, um, so I guess I can, I'll uh, open my video too, hope I don't look too, too wild. So uh, I'm Nick Carpenter, I'm the youth educator, uh, essentially what my job is, is I help being someone uh, with autism, working for Techie Spin, and who is the age 25, I use my experiences leaving high school and going into college and going into the workforce after that. I use my experiences with that time of my life to help other youth with disabilities that are in their transition age, that 16 to mid-20s age group, and I make Things like the like I made the I worked on the self advocacy tips infographic and video as well as the self determination infographic and video. So I help kind of use my own experience and what's worked for me, what hasn't worked for me to help other uh, young adults who are were in a similar position to me, getting fresh out of high school and not really knowing what they're supposed to do afterwards with their life. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Nick is uh, a very, very, very valuable member of our team um, and is happy to work with individuals uh, on developing these skills um, as needed. Uh, we do have a, another question. Uh, Bonnie asks if the, resp okay, the respondent needs a lawyer and it's covered if they can't afford one. Does that apply to the child's income or the parent's? It's been my understanding that that would apply to the child's income, but I can get you a definite answer or find out if that is uh, determined by each, you know, in each county. Uh, so whoever is writing down what questions we're answering and including in our follow-up email, please include this one. Again, um, it is my understanding that it's the child's income, but I do want to make sure. Okay, and uh, we appreciate you, Nick, uh, sharing your story. Um, and I just want to, at this time, we have about six minutes left, so I want to open it up. Does anybody else have any additional questions? I'm not seeing any, um, and I think I'm going to hand this back over to Amber so she can close us out. I really appreciate your interaction today. Um, I do not 
take this uh, this topic lightly at all. Um, like I said, I wrestle every single day. My coworkers can tell you about, you know, 10 times a month, I say Cody needs a guardian and I don't want to be it. Um, I say it all the time. I think it was um, three times so today. I'm just kidding. Probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, but I, I will, uh, like I said, I will hand this back over to Amber and you guys can just be looking for our follow-up, uh, our follow-up email. Well, I am back. So before you all take off, uh, I do want to ask you, there is a QR code here on the screen. If you can grab that with your smartphone um, or you will be receiving an email following this webinar, please go in and fill that out. We value your thoughts and opinions um, and, you know, whether you like something, you didn't like it, you would like more of it please, please fill this evaluation out. This is what helps us meet the needs of the Kentucky families and professionals. Um, and we want to hear from all of you. Also, upon filling out the evaluation, you will receive a certificate of attendance uh, in case that's needed, if you need that for an employer um, or whatnot. I do wanna go over a few of our upcoming events um, that are really important as well. Uh, in May, on May 9th, we are going to be doing an equity inclusion for individuals with disabilities. Um, also in May, the 15th and 16th, we are gonna be doing bridging the gap in special education training for parents and families. And this is gonna walk um, parents and guardians completely through the special education process, uh, IEPs, 504s, independent health plans, um, functional behavioral assessments, uh, behavioral intervention plans, things that we get a whole lot of questions on uh, that parents just need extra support in knowing how best to assist their students. And then also, in October on the 18th, we are going to have a stress management for the caregiver. Um, and honestly, who doesn't need stress management right now um, in, in life? So uh, whether you're a caregiver or not, we, we ask that you join that. Um, there's going to be a lot of valuable information as well. Um, if you have any questions or you think of something later, feel free to reach out to us. Our phone number and website is listed. You will be receiving a copy of this um, session today. So please reach out to us. There are referral forms on our website if you need one-on-one -on -one assistance or if you know of a family who does need assistance. And once again, we just wanna say thank you. Um, thank you for coming and, and letting us work with you and give more information on guardianship. And we hope to um, see you guys in our upcoming events. And Michelle, yes, I will be sending all of these to you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great day.